Well, hey, Ray. Hey, Dave. It's uh, good to see you again, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm uh, sitting here in um, Ojai, California. And of course, uh, it's still the 2020 pandemic. And you know what is funny? What is the most useless gift of the year 2019? Last year? <laughs> Boy, I have no idea. What are you What are you thinking about? Uh, the most useless gift of 2019 is a 2020 day planner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or airplane tickets, or yeah, yeah. Oh my vacation God. rentals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I see what you mean. Yeah, here we are stuck. The pandemic rages on, but um, yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, there's some awesome stuff. Uh, oh wait, you told me you had bears outside your window. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm really not with it, man, because uh, I didn't get very much sleep last night. I was woken up by bears, of all things. Yeah, I in the middle of the night, it's 1 a.m., I hear this, rrr, 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 and I swear it wasn't me. I wasn't listening to my own snoring or anything. It wasn't my wife. And I looked out our bedroom window, and it, literally on the other side of the screen was a big black bear standing up on its rear feet looking at me. And then I noticed there were two cubs. He was looking in the window? She, she was. She, yeah. Because <laughs> it was a mama bear. Mama bear with two very large cubs. And these are the cubs that broke into my studio, underneath my studio. And uh, the other night, a couple of nights before that, and they evidently are like on this, th this is their path and that they take and they go so right through are, the yard. These are black bears because Revilla Hejedo, Ketchikan is on Revilla Hejedo Island and the grizzly bears are on the mainland of Canada and Alaska, but there are no brown bears these are just black bears. Grizzlies are brown bears. We do have brown bears here in the Alexander Archipelago on the islands, but not on this island. Right. And people generally say it's the ABC islands. Admiralty, Baranoff, and Chichagoff are the only ones with brown bears. And a brown and there are bear no black is bears. an Ursus horribilis. That's right. Ursus horribilis. What is a black bear called? Black bear is Ursus Americanus. Wait, 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 so, wait, wait. You're saying that it's not horribilis? I think <laughs> I say horribilis, you know, horrible. It, yeah, but it's horrible. But it's a grizzly. It's horrible. You would not want to meet one on a dark night coming home after no. drinking in a bar. And uh, yeah, the thing is with black bears, they say you could fight it off. But you, if you find, if you run into a, a, a brown bear, don't even try to fight. But, um, yeah, well, you have to play dead. And I've read those. I have that book. I think it's called uh, Alaska Bear Tales. Have you heard that? I read that one? There is Alaska Bear Tales. Uh, when I first moved to Alaska, I got a book called uh, uh, Bear Attacks, Their Cause and Avoidance. They say you have to curl up in a ball, play dead. 50% of the people who did that went away unscathed. The other 50% got their skull crushed or their backs ripped open. I mean, there yeah. is no rhyme or reason but I guess the best thing is to to stay like you're dead. Well, yeah, with a brown bear. They do say you should try to fight a black bear. But, Dave, you know, speaking of bears, I was once invited to speak at a, a bear conference. So bear specialists. So wait, you were naked. <laughs> <laughs> well, under my clothes I was. But uh, I stood up in front uh, of them. And it wasn't a, wasn't a dream. It wasn't a nightmare or anything. I stood up in front and I talked about bears. But... What I should do is I, sh I know about the evolutionary history of bears, and I wonder how many of these guys, these people really know where bears come from, you know? I mean, since I'm into deep time and all you that. You mean, what's their proto-animal? What, what is their lineage? Yeah, yeah. What, what have they evolved from? Well, I decided to do a survey of 100 people. This is before I went to speak at this conference. Interviewed 100 people. Just asking them, what is the closest, what's the closest mammal group in terms of evolution to bears? Asked 100 people, and only 3% got it right. And the answers Hold that on. they gave. Can I, can I, okay, well, wait. You want to play? Yeah, let me play. All right. Because um, you, you maybe know this or? Well, I probably heard it years ago, but forgot. And, and I'm just going to okay. say, are you talking, what, 10 million years ago? No, well, I mean. In terms of modern day animals, when you look around, what's the closest cousin, oh, cousin to, to a bear? A bear? Uh, okay? Uh, okay, yeah, what's the closest cousin? Not a bear, but what's the closest uh, I'll mammalian say group? A, cousin? a wolverine or a beaver or a badger. 
That's pretty good. Really? That's pretty good. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're close. You're not as far off as other people. Uh, we found that 7% said pigs, <laughs> which I think is... Well, just look at the... But people, wait, wait, wait. Look at the, look at the pig foot. That's like... Right. That's the major clue. A hooved animal. Yeah. That's a major clue. But people kind of look at bears, big, round, kind of chunky, you know, so they think pigs. So 7% said pigs. Most people had, like, what are you talking about? And I said, I had to explain it. What are they related to? 8% said cats and lions. And this is what astounded me. 15% said humans, apes, and monkeys. Primates. What? Yeah. Because, <laughs> well, actually, one of the anecdotes you hear when you skin out a bear, especially up here in Alaska, you skin oh, out a bear, God. it looks just like a human, which is kind of true. Let me guess, were these the same people who, when they were asked to point to uh, France on a world map, they pointed to, like, Africa? <laughs> <laughs> no, these are actually kind of educated sort of folks, you know I mean? I, I, I okay, like to so think that most of the people that walk in are Okay, so let's flip all the cards and find but wait, out. All right, all right. But then 20% said wolverines okay. and raccoons and badgers, weasels. 25% dogs and wolves. Canine. And only 3% said seals, sea lions, and walruses. And they are the ones who are correct. What? The closest cousins. You're saying marine mammals are yes. the closest cousins to bears. The pinnipeds oh, is what the oh my group God. is called. They're part of the carnivora, carnivore line. Now, I've, carnivora. I've read extensive uh, papers on uh, Ursus articus, the polar bear. Yeah. Scientists want to reclassify that as a marine mammal because... They found them 50 miles out in open sea. They, they are frequently referred to as marine mammals. Yeah, they, they, are, they, they are heading back to the sea. So you're saying that pinnipeds, seals, walruses, and bears have a common single ancestor? Well, think of them as bears that have gone to sea, like the polar bear, but they have evolutionarily split off. They were separated so much from the other bears or this, this bear. So they have a common ancestor, uh, was one that was a, was a creature that began to lurk by. I actually think of them as bears that were working the other end of the creek <laughs> during a salmon run. And actually, I, I, I really do think this and they began to be really separated. But they that's that's what makes drives evolution is the separation of the groups. And so basically... I look at bears, uh, they should not be called sea lions. We should call them sea bears. You, you have to draw that. You got to draw a, a creek, a creek entrance where one group of bears become the furry ones in the forest. The other ones become the ones with flippers. Well, it really is that kind of scene. When you look at, uh, uh, when I go down, to, and this is the time of year in Alaska, you go down to a salmon stream and you can see bears at one end and seals at the other end. Oh, and right, basically, right. they're cousins. They're working both ends. of. So so it's a really cool thing. That is amazing. But actually, one of the coolest groups, Dave, that maybe you don't know about, there was a group. Uh, they are kind of close to bears and dogs. Um, I mean, wolves and, and dogs. Like I said, uh, wolverines are closer. So I like to draw these evolutionary trees out. And you can look up my bear family tree. You can find it online or on our oh, website. Oh, I've seen that. It's awesome. Yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. drawing. But there was a group called the Bear Dogs. So basically think of this. And they were a very diverse group. They evolved. They were very successful. All kinds of species. Some of them got to be the size of modern day bears. But they're basically... Wait, are those the bear dogs that Amy talked about? Amy Atwater talked about yes, last week? Yes. Oh, uh, And okay. there is this one really large one that actually lurked around your part of the world uh, because I've seen some beautiful fossils of it from uh, California. You mean Hollywood? <laughs> yeah. It's called Amphicyon. Uh, it's one of the biggest badass. Oh, I uh, think he got arrested. I think he's in jail <laughs> at the moment. He's got a bad rap. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, and why? Here's Let me get on my soapbox for just a second. Do you mind if I get up on my soapbox for just a minute? <laughs> Please, Bear with Make me. Make it quick. We've got an awesome guest today. Make it quick. Make it bear quick. Bear with me. He's waiting. Me. He's waiting on the phone. All right. Bear with me. See, I'm, it's a pun there. I know you're uh, you're barely paying attention. But, Dave, here I was in a biologist meeting, and I'm saying people think when they walk, when they encounter a bear on a trail, they're thinking of it like a pig, or they're thinking as if they've run into a monkey. 
I think it's, it's it's actually could save your life if you know that they behave like, you know, they're close to dogs and wolves. They're going to behave like a dog. You turn and run from a dog, what's it going to do? It's going to come after you. So I think if you encounter a bear... Um, give it a treat. You give it a treat. <laughs> you give it a treat. <laughs> you give it a big chunk of liver. <laughs> but anyways, I, I think it's a fascinating uh, way to look at the world in terms of where things come from. Yeah. No, that that is uh, that is absolutely astounding. I would never have guessed a marine mammals and, and your grizzly bear or your black bear at Yellowstone Park. Uh, hey, boo boo. Hey. Uh, so you are smarter than the average bear. You didn't really know that about the bears and the, and the seals. How could anybody know that? It's just you don't make that connection. It's absolutely a, a, a blank in, in one's brain. But we should know we, this. We should know this. We should be teaching this. Okay. All right. So, dude, um, we have an unbelievable cool guest today. We do. We do. He's a Canadian fellow, Dr. Leif Tapanilla. And uh, I met Leif mm, about 10 years ago. Okay, and he is in Idaho at the University of Idaho in Pocatello, which is only... Right, he's actually at Idaho State University. Don't mix him up, man. So he will take offense at that. So he's in Pocatello, Idaho State University. He's also the director of the Idaho Museum of Natural History. Yes. And uh, I saw at... some awesome 3D virtual fossils there. You can go on their website and and pick them up and look them and turn them around. And it's just cool. And I saw some fossil specimens of what we're going to be talking about today That's which right. is what that what is... are we talking about today well the buzzsaw shark man that's so cool that's so cool you want to give him a ring yeah let's do that let's call up lee all right all right well i see three gentlemen here me ray and tapanilla leaf hey dave how are you doing good to meet you too let's where's your ray troll t-shirt Oh crap! I wore I wore a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> That's very Canadian of you. Where in Australia are you? Uh, oh, hi, California. Oh well, that's not Australia. <laughs> no, no. I, I work in Australia and okay. live live in Ojai. Yeah. Okay. He's a big deal in Australia, Leave. David Strassman. David who? Well, very good. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an honor, actually. Uh, I, I'm blown away by all the geology that you know and learned and studied because I'm a big fan. Uh, John McPhee, Basin and Range. Oh, yeah. Basin and Range turned me on to geology. And from then on, I was hooked. And that turned me on to paleontology and fossils and deep time. So uh, you live in a really cool geologic area. You know, since I moved out west, it's been hard to top it anywhere else, really. Where, where are you from? You say you, came, you moved out west. You started out back east, and uh, let's, let's get your background. Where, where are you from, man? Born and raised in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, which Slippery? Is Sudbury. Oh. <laughs> Sudbury. Slippery would be great. No, it's, uh, it's uh, Sudbury. It is the uh, nickel capital of the world. We're very proud of that. It's got a 120-year history of digging rocks out of the ground for nickel and copper and gold and platinum group elements. It's the second largest impact structure in the world, right after oh. Vertifort, South Africa, right? So you mean it's, it's a, a meteorite impact? Oh, yeah. It's a 1.8 and a half million year old impact strike in, on the Canadian Shield. And it's, uh, it's a big oval-shaped crater my house, my parents' house is right in the middle, ground zero of that impact crater. How big is it? It's, uh, oh gosh, 100 kilometers from end to end. It's massive. That is massive. Can you see oh, yeah. some space? Yeah, when you look at uh, satellite images, it looks like a, a smushed oval because the, the, the last billion years of time has, has sheared that part of the world. Um, so it used to be a circle, but now it's a, an oval. And then perched on the edge of that huge impact crater, we have the Wanapate crater, crater, which is a 40 million year old impact crater on top of it. Wow. So wait, how old's the big one? 1.85 uh, billion. Oh, billion. Okay. Billion. All right. It is super old. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so I grew up in, in like a geologic mecca. Everybody knows, geologists know Sudbury because it's an impact crater and it's got one of the richest ore deposits in the world. So I went back there for my master's. My master's was back in Sudbury at Laurentian University, oh, where I worked sweet. with my first real paleontologist there, and uh, a Canadian paleontologist, Paul Copper. 
and he was into invertebrate paleontology and working in the Ordovician Silurian reef ecosystems, uh, mostly in, in Atlantic Canada. Quick aside, the Ordovician period, roughly 475 million years ago, was known for its diversity of marine invertebrates like trilobites and brachiopods, including evidence of the first land plants. However, a massive extinction occurred at the end of it, marking the beginning of the Silurian period, which killed off 85% of all marine species. Game over. I started off life as an invertebrate paleontologist with a very strong geology background starting to build. And so that's really professionally where I lie. I'm an invertebrate uh, slash trace fossil paleontologist, more geology than biology most of the time. Uh, you have a paper called Tracking Late Devonian Reactivation of the Thule Arch with Detrital Zircon Province yes. Great Basin. <laughs> What does that mean? That's a mouthful. That's a fun yes. one. One of my students and I worked on this project. Uh, so when I started working out here out west, still thinking about marine Paleozoic rocks, the western corridor of the Intermountain West, we call it, is a whole series of more or less north and south oriented mountain ranges with valleys in between. And they're almost equally spaced. They look like, uh, when you look at a satellite image, it looks like a bunch of caterpillars marching to the north. And those are the ranges. And the way they're set up, as John McPhee wrote about in the Basin Range. Quick aside, if you haven't read John McPhee, you should. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning American author and is widely considered one of the pioneers of creative nonfiction. He makes reading about science and nature fun, and more importantly, so you and I can understand it. Now, back to Lee's description of the Basin and Range Mountains. A set of dominoes that have been tilted on their side as, as California is kind of racing away from the rest of North America to the north and west. And it's creating this open space that the mountain ranges can kind of slide on their backs and, and form these north-south oriented mountain ranges. And in that area, we have unbelievably well exposed, continuously exposed uh, Paleozoic and a bit of Mesozoic age rocks that run all the way through there, all the way from Idaho down to Nevada. Wait, where, where does the Paleozoic end? At the Cambrian? Well, yeah. So we have the Cambrian, which is the lowest part of the Paleozoic, which lowest starts part. around, yeah. So it's about 540 million years the youngest, old. The youngest part of the Paleozoic. So the youngest Paleozoic is 251 million years old, and that's the Permian. Give me a quick aside, Ray. The Permian is when all the world's land masses squished together into one big supercontinent called Pangaea. It was surrounded by a vast ocean called Panthalassa, and most famously, the biggest mass extinction ever happened at the very end of the Permian, when over 90% of all life went extinct. What do you, what do you, that's all, folks. Okay, wait, just a real quick, we have the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. Yeah. And, and, the, the, and, then, and then the Cenozoic on top. All right. And, so we're, just, and we're, live, we're alive in the Cenozoic. That's our correct. era. Yeah. Well, we're alive in the Anthropocene. Oh, darn right. <laughs> the plastic, the plastic pocene. The plastic so, scene. The Paleozoic goes from the beginning of Earth, or is it, a, or is it the beginning oh. of life on Earth? That's the beginning of uh, shell-making animals. That's really what it is. Complex life. Over a billion years of Earth history is uh, we've got um, scum mats, the stromatolites, those little algal buildups that we find, um, and that's life. Were they the ones that made the oxygen on our atmosphere and the huge right. great ore deposits of iron in Australia that were they're, exactly. they're selling to the China? That's right. That's exactly it. So uh, the, the first big polluters of the world, right? Pooping out <laughs> oxygen as their waste product, which we all breathe in and use in our bodies. That's the uh, cyanobacteria, these, these stromatolite making mounds. But they created oxygen, which allowed more complex life to evolve. Well, that's just it. So, so animals, the fundamental truth about you and me as an animal is we eat oxygen for a living. And without enough oxygen in the atmosphere, animals cannot exist. Our metabolism requires that we eat oxygen and poop out carbon dioxide. And they are just really the opposite of that. They eat carbon dioxide and poop out oxygen. Well, not so, really poop. Breathe. They poop it out. Oh, they poop it out. It's oh. different. Okay, that's right, because they're cells. But, but we don't that's poop right. it out. We, we exhale. I like four-letter words, and poop is, uh, can be gas <laughs> sometimes, too. 
When I'm looking through your uh, research gate uh, and all the papers that you've done, I was surprised. Yeah. And the sharks come along later, and we'll get to that in a second. But yeah. you had a whole s a series of uh, adventures in Africa. What's that all about? I didn't know that about you, man. Yeah. So uh, when I was working at Utah for the PhD in Salt Lake City, uh, I met a whole bunch of graduate students, a great graduate program there. And a lot of the people I worked with as grad students are still collaborators today. And Eric Roberts is one of the key ones that I started working with. The actor? The Eric, yeah, right. Uh, he's, he's the lesser known Eric Roberts, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Never trust a man with two first names. Well, you got, you got to watch out, right? Um, so Eric uh, and I were lab mates, and he was already starting to work out in Africa. On Now he works on in many different countries out there. But he had started a project with Maureen O'Leary, who was working on uh, uh, mammals right across the KT boundary, looking at how mammals basically take, take, uh, take flight at, as soon as the dinosaurs get wiped out. And uh, she had started a project in Mali, in, in the West African country of Mali, and they needed an invertebrate guy. And so they brought me on board. We're working in the middle of the Sahara Desert, which, as you can imagine, right, it's camels, it's dry, it's hot, 120 some degrees every day. Um, pretty remote part of the world to, to work. And the outcrops, you'd really have to fight to find an outcrop between the sand dunes, lots of driving. But when you got an outcrop, what you were seeing is rocks that were showing the history of when an ocean actually cut through the what is now the Sahara Desert. And it really split Africa into two halves. There was, uh, there was an inland sea, just like there was an inland sea in North America during this time period. There was one in the, in the Sahara. And we were finding shallow marine animals right running through the course of what now is the huge, hot, flaming desert. Yeah. Is that the same inland sea where they're finding all the whales uh, in Egypt and, and the crocodilians? And very, very much similar to that. Uh, that inland sea doesn't extend all the way as far east as Egypt, but they have an equivalent uh, flooding of the continent there. And that's where all the really cool Egyptian whale fossils, like you're saying, came out. Same time period, they're getting Eocene age uh, animals out there. And so the rocks we were looking at go right through the KT boundary and into the Eocene as well. You know, we found mounds and mounds and mounds of fossil shit out there. Coprolites, <laughs> more coprolites per, per square foot than you could ever imagine. Was this uh, poo you'd find in, here we are back to poo again. Is this poo yeah. you'd find, was it fossilized in the actual marine environment or is it something external on the land and then covered with sediment or ash? So, so we would actually find uh, beds of, of, of conglomerate. So a geologic rock, a conglomerate is like gravel sized pieces that all get accumulated into a deposit, into a unit. So we were finding a, a deposit of, of conglomerate that went on for about four square kilometers and maybe, oh, about four to five feet thick and covering that whole area. And, you know, nuggets that, that were discernible pieces of coprolite, poop, <laughs> right? Of nothing but like- shit Acres of poop. Acres and acres of fossil- Is this from obviously marine mammals? Yeah, so, so what's really cool is some of them are preserved well and you could actually see spirals. They'd be spiral poops. And spiral <laughs> poops form in the spiral guts of sharks. And so some of them, you could, you could trace them back to being sharks. Some of them were large enough and straight enough that you could say, oh, these are probably made by crocodiles. Some are made by smaller fish, that kind of thing. And if you break them open, you can find bones and uh, crustaceans. You could find what they ate, of course, right? But these were rocks. I mean, you had to crack them open. They were rocks. Uh, first thing, people, when you give them a coprolite, they smell it. It's, it's intuitive. <laughs> Everybody always will smell it. And if you, you could dare it. somebody. Don't look it. No, 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 you can dare people to lick it. That's gross. And it doesn't taste like anything. Um, but anyway, so we had acres and acres and acres of poop. And so one of the things that we noticed inside is some of the poop was drilled into. Now, in my former life, I used to work on trace fossils and animals that drill into rocks for a living, bio rotors. And there are clams, there are modern day clams like uh, shipworm. But there's clams that drill into whole, it drill into rocks. And you'll see them on the coastline. You'll see holes in rocks all the time. And there's a special kind of uh, types of clams that do this. We found coprolites, get this, that had drill holes in them. And even the shell of the clam itself preserved in there. And so this means that the coprolites, get this, back in the day, in the Eocene, 40 million years ago, on the seafloor, if you're swimming, scuba diving over the seafloor, you would have found coprolites 
hard fossil coccolites sitting on the seafloor that were then getting occupied and drilled into by clams, which is the first instance of fossil holy shit. <laughs> There you go. That's that's that's. I love that lead in, Leith. That was there you great. Go. But uh, yeah, boring clams. Wow. Boring clams. Wow. Yeah. But, and clams uh, are not boring. Clams are really exciting. They can be fantastic. They, are. they can be. So they they these are fossils within a fossil. Fossils. They're fossils in a fossil, and it tells us something about the environment. We made a big deal about it, telling about uh, how coprolites could actually fossilize, then become an environment that is used by the modern animals that are living on but top of them and drilling and whatever. To clarify, they were fossilized from marine animals and yeah. then somehow did it dry out to turn to rock and then flood again? So it turns out there's a huge phosphorus deposit and this is gonna to totally link back to the sharks we're gonna talk about in a minute uh. because one of the biggest deposits of phosphate rocks is in Mali, in that deposit. So phosphate is a sedimentary rock type is where we get fertilizers from. People dig that up, crush it up, get the phosphate. That guano. Phosphorus. And guano, that's exactly it. And so that's actually a really rare deposit in the world to get in marine rocks. And so we wanted to know how you're getting these accumulations of phosphate in Mali and, uh, and in other places. But how do you get it in marine environment anyway? Well, yeah, so you have to have ocean water that allows for it to preserve. Animals love chewing up phosphorus because we need it to live. And so usually it doesn't survive in sediments at all unless the ocean bottom waters are really low in oxygen. And we think at times in that basin, there are real oxygen shortages that allowed that phosphate to build up. And we have a deposit out here in Idaho, the Phosphoria Formation, which is one of the largest deposits of phosphate in the world, sedimentary phosphate in the world. And it's right here in Idaho, in, in my corner of Idaho. And it's the same deal. There was low oxygen in the bottom waters that allowed this phosphate to build up. So anoxic fresh water allows phosphorus to precipitate? Yeah, that's, that's it. So if you have a low amount of oxygen at the seafloor, then the animals and critters that want to feed on and use up that phosphorus that's in the environment, they're excluded. They can't live down there because, again, they have to eat oxygen. So if you can get low oxygen conditions on the bottom of the, of the seafloor, then you can accumulate things like carbon and phosphorus and some other elements that otherwise we usually don't see as rich in sedimentary rocks. Just one question. So the phosphorus itself is, is basically organic material. Can we think of it as dead fish and dead, dead whatever, plankton yeah. and everything else just That's all totally settling it. down? That's totally it. So yeah, so... The, the big accumulators of phosphorus in the ocean, for example, are the phytoplankton that are floating in the ocean right. water algae, right? And then, of course, the bones of animals. They're, we're also con concentrating phosphorus as we make our bones and teeth. And then eventually that can end up back up into the sediment in, in the environment, get recycled back in. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly it. Back it up. <laughs> no, we're not backing up. Back it up. Well, let's no. move forward. <laughs> let's segue forward. Let's swim sure. forward or swim whatever. Forward. I read a National Geographic article yeah. last December yeah. about your investigations and discoveries regarding the Helicoprion oh, buzzsaw yes. shark. And in the body of that National Geographic article mentioned that you turned on to Mr. Ray Troll, who had made this shark an obsession. That's right. Well, Ray can talk about his obsession. <laughs> we shall. <laughs> That's going back 21 years, maybe? So how did you guys meet? How did this happen? How did you get involved in the shark, and how did you meet Ray? Right. So I, I'm here in Idaho. This is back maybe in 2011, around there, maybe? 2010. 2010. Yeah. And uh, so I'm doing my research on other things. Uh, and I had a student at the time, Jesse Pruitt, who was working with me in the museum. He asked me, hey, is there anything that I can do research on? And I said, hey, why don't you go down into the basement collections and snoop around? 
So he snooped around and he uh, saw all sorts of cool things that are down there, but he kind of honed in on this one fossil, this spiral fossil with little pointy triangles sticking off of it. And uh, he said, hey Leaf, so we've got Helicoprion here. And I said, yeah, I think somebody told me once that we have a bunch of those, I've seen them. He said, uh, what's the deal with those? I said, well, I don't know. I, I remember seeing them in the textbook when I was learning about fossils and it's a spiral, it's a shark, we don't know much about it. And, and he said, well, can I start studying it? I said, sure. I started having him measure everything he could do, right? Like measure the spiral, measure how big the teeth are and all this kind of stuff, because that's, that's sort of my way of thinking. Measure what he can. So, so wait, just describe it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a spiral. Oh. It's, it's a spiral. So it is a spiral that starts off very small and gets bigger and bigger, right? It wraps around about three, four times, maybe four and a half times. It With lifts on its triangular, itself. great white teeth on it. It's got long, skinny, uh, with a big triangular point on the top. The top point of the teeth is serrated on both sides. And so as you go from the middle of the spiral to the outside spiral, you go from little teeth that are small in size, and they gradually, very gradually, get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the last tooth that's preserved. When you look at one of these spirals, you go from uh, tooth one in the middle, and then maybe by the time you get to the outside, you're up to the 125th or 130th tooth. And what's the smallest tooth and what's the biggest? So the smallest tooth is about, uh, let's see, an eighth of an inch long. And then the largest tooth in inches would be uh, four or five. Five inches, yeah. Yeah. That's it's comparable big. to a great white today. Bigger than that. There's always a bigger fish. Bigger but. than a great white especially when you consider the root that it's on and uh, yeah. the overall tooth there, you know. A yeah, great white tooth would be maybe about two inches. These are some of the biggest ones, five inches. And the whorls are approaching two feet across, right, Leith? Yeah, two, two and a half feet across yeah. for the biggest spirals that we have. Imagine a buzzsaw blade, but in a spiral, not just a circular blade. It's That's literally in, cut into a spiral. That's, that's exactly it. And they are, they're weird looking things. Um, they're, they're really obvious when you see one and they're really charismatic because it's a spiral with ever larger teeth. It's and arguably, I think they're one of the most beautiful fossils. They, for me, the, the most beautiful fossils in the world, these beautiful spirals, they look like an ammonite. So Jesse is the guy in the collections who found uh, yeah. this fossil. So Jesse, my student is working down in the basement. He sees these spirals. He starts asking all of the questions I can't answer. And uh, he finds out from our collections manager that this guy, Ray Troll, was snooping around in our collections, borrowing things in years past. Maybe, maybe Jesse should contact him. And so that's when Jesse contacted Ray. Jesse had his own theory, but he said, hey, I understand you're the guy that knows about this shark. So a graduate student is calling an, an undergrad is mm -hmm. calling an artist for more information. <laughs> yes, because I was the link between these researchers who had passed away about 10 years earlier. So Reiner Zangrel passed away in 2004. Who's that? Dr. Reiner Zangrel was at the Field Museum. He was a Swiss-born paleontologist. He worked at Paleozoic Sharks, and he published a lot on all these weird sharks with these centerline teeth. I first saw a helicoprion uh, fossil in LA in 1993, blew my mind, and I was told to go contact, just like Jesse was told to contact me, I was told, if you want to know more about that, there's only one guy, and Reiner Zangrel was the one I went to. But then Reiner said, you know, the guy who really knows is this Danish guy, so Sven uh, Bendix Ongring, uh, so over in Copenhagen. And so I started corresponding with him, and I became kind of the de facto helicoprion guy. And then these two older gentlemen passed away, and they had told me, Ben De Song Green had told me about one certain fossil that was in the Idaho collection that was the key to understanding this fossil. And it was called Idaho Number no. 4 in his paper that he published in 1966. This is the Danish guy published in the paper said, in this one fossil, there's cartilage. I can see the snout. I can see the nose, the nostrils, and all that stuff. It's all there. The spiral is located in the lower jaw. And this had blown paleontologists' minds 
for 100 years before that. They've been found in Russia, all over the world. Tell me what they look like beforehand. Well, I mean, what did they think that the spiral, if it wasn't in the lower jaw, where did they think it was? Good question, Dave. There were all kinds of suppositions and reconstructions, and they'd been put on the snout of the shark. They'd been put on the tail of the shark. They'd been put- Tail? You know, on the tail, hanging off the tail, because sometimes sharks have weird things in their tail. Fin spine was one of the first theories, too. It was a fin spine, but where it is, and that's because the teeth are preserved, nothing else. But lo and behold, there actually is cartilage. Nobody was really looking carefully at that. And that's where, actually, now you can tie this all back together, Leaf. What did Jesse, and then things started taking off again. Yeah, so once, once we uh, pulled Idaho number four off the shelf and started looking at it and reading through the Bendix Omgreen 1966 paper, it was clear he could see stuff on the outside of the fossil, right, of the rock itself. But the, but the big problem, the big shortcoming back in 1965 when he was doing the work is he could only see the outside of the rock. No and CT of course, scans. We have CT scanners today. And of course, we've got ones that have enough juice in them to be able to see into, into the rock. And so the next step of the project was to find a CT scanner that could do this work. And, and UT Austin is the one that has it. I remember one of the first time, first things as we all started corresponding emails and all that, and I finally got on the phone with Jesse is one of the first attempts was, well, let's just take Idaho number four over to the local hospital. Uh -huh. Remember that? And there yeah. were some scans done. And there was just, but what's what's the deal with the scanner in Austin? What what why can it see in the rock, and my yeah. local hospital can't do that? There's a few things different. I'm I'm not sure of all the super technicalities of it, but there's two big things. So we we did try running a few different specimens through the hospital uh, CT. It's the same technology, but hospitals have insurance policies, <laughs> and uh, aspect of a CT scanner is the emitter. The, the little filament that produces the, the x-rays, that's a very expensive part to replace. And the insurance does not allow you to turn up, turn the, uh, turn the dial up to 11. And we really <laughs> need to turn it up to 11 in order to see through rock. So they're, they're not able to pump enough juice through it. So the one in Austin, not only can you turn up the juice, but it's also designed to be able to take that much signal to be able to, to see uh, very fine uh, density contrasts in rocks in particular. And so they're, they're just well-tuned for that kind of work. So Jesse brought the rock down to Texas, had them scan it, and, uh, and those scan files came back. And, and what we found inside was just remarkable. One, Bendix Omgreen did a pretty hell of a good job uh, based on just the limited view that he could see on the outside of the rock. And you know, making some educated guesses in describing what the soft parts are. Yeah, good. It, yeah. He did a pretty good job of seeing where the cartilage went, and then he had to make some guesses about how it traveled through the rock. And uh, we were able to, you know, connect those dots in a, in sort of a new way. What we we're able to see once we uh, pulled digitally pulled the fossil apart is that the lower jaw indeed contains the, the spiral, the whorl of teeth. And it's sandwiched between a left side and right side of the jaw. So just like your jaw, uh, the, the spiral is basically where your tongue is in your mouth. And the lower jaw uh, holds on both the left and right side. It holds this spiral upright by means of two cartilages that come in on either side and cup it on left and right sides, like a buttress. Okay. Is there an axle? Does it cup it at the axle of the spiral? Actually, cut just above it, actually. On the, on the outermost upper whorl, where, the act, where I'd say the active teeth are, the teeth that are actually doing work, on the upper surface, the, the cartilages from the lower jaw come up and, and kind of snug onto both the left and right side, just to brace it. So it's holding like 60% of that, that whorl. Yeah, so 60% of that whorl is in the lower jaw. It's just between the left and right side of the lower jaw. And if you were looking at the shark in the face with all of its flesh on, you would not see the center of that spiral. It's totally, completely entombed in the lower jaw. And only the top biggest dozen teeth or so are actually visible and being used. Ever met someone where when they, they relax their face, their teeth are still showing and it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> sir, do you ever close your mouth? I, that's what I think in my head. But 
that's a ventriloquist thinking. Hmm. So that, that's is this the strut that you discovered that that sort of support strut as the sequence yeah. to reveal those, that? Those are the labial cartilages right. we wound up calling them. Yeah. So my reconstructions that I had drawn. So I was drawing the shark in the '90s and the early 2000s as well. I owned it. It was mine. So I knew it was in the lower jaw. But then this whole thing just really opened it up. And we found out I, the main difference is I think leaf were that, you know, there were these ideas that the, the spiral was out at the end of the jaw, but now this extraordinary insight was the lower jaw was completely filled with these teeth, this beautiful spiral. That's right. And, you know, to me, like you said, that's the, that is really the most important finding is that you can show that the entire spiral is exactly the same as the length of the lower jaw, which means the implication of that is when the jaw opens and closes, you have the, the almost a circular curve of these steak knives. That's the, that's the cutting surface, follows this really tight curve. Uh, but instead of acting on the end of a very, very long jaw, if it were on the end of a long jaw, when the mouth closes, that curve of teeth points up. You puncture, you, you wind up puncturing your animal. But because I'm on a very short jaw, the curve of teeth actually rakes across like a saw. Each tooth spirals and acts like a little saw. So we have 10 or 12 little saws rotating about 30 degrees through the meat as it bites down. So it's a perfect slicer. What's in the upper jaw, man? There, there was, there's this weird thing. It, it goes into the upper jaw. And then I'm sure we think that this is solved, but I'm betting you still get theories bounced off you all the time, don't you? Oh, you absolutely. Wrong. <laughs> absolutely. I, I got one just last month, actually. Somebody saying... Yeah. Well, I read your papers, but don't you think this could be yes. da, 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 da? So the upper jaw, the lower jaw has the teeth, the big pointy teeth, and the upper jaw is sort of a cup shape that receives those upper teeth, uh, or the lower teeth. As the mouth closes, there's this cavity that the meat gets pushed into and sliced, okay? So it's confined, so it kind of crimps it, right? And then the teeth slice it through. But the upper jaw, as it turns out, there's one specimen in the world that is absolutely beautiful at showing this. It's in the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian's best specimen of Helicoprion has been smashed with a sledgehammer. I love it. It's ugly. So it looks like a perfect autopsy. You can put the pieces back together and see a cross section that no one would ever do with their Helicoprion. They <laughs> cut it in half. They hit it with a hammer. And what you can see in the upper jaw, lining that cup shape, are little tiny uh, little plate teeth. And so it would have been like a cutting board on the inside. Maybe it helped oh grip God. the fish, but not cut them, right? They're little tiny little itty bitty plate teeth, maybe uh, an eighth of an inch in size, little diamond shaped teeth, beautiful things. Quick aside, if you're having trouble following exactly how this shark ripped apart its prey, check out our website, paleonerds.com for a video of the chomping jaw. And one of the things too that the group did as we we mounted an exhibit about this too, it traveled around when the paper came out in 2013. What do you start calling it? What's the easy thing to call it? Uh, you know, we're kicking around different ideas and uh, I used to call it the world tooth, but then uh, I remember when it's like, no, 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 let's just call it. And I think maybe it was Kurt, you know, we'd kicked around the idea of buzzsaw with this, you know, should we call it that? So, and it stuck. So it's yes. the buzzsaw shark. I think it's a great description. Well, it, it looks like a buzzsaw shark. I can't get my head around the evolutionary beginning of how something like this, what would its prototype be 100 million years before it? We have some ideas on that, uh, of how, how do you get to Helicoprion, right? Because Helicoprion is weird. I'll say it, like, there is no animal today or that has ever been that has a spiral of its own teeth that it retains for its entire life that it holds inside its jaw. There's no animal that does this ever. What is it called when it's when dentition is central? 
we call it symphysial. Symphysial teeth are in the midline of the jaw. Now, there's a few things about Helicoprion that are absolutely key to understanding this animal, and everything follows from this. Yes. There are two things. Sharks, sharks like this animal, make teeth throughout their life. So I'm making new teeth at the back of my mouth in this case, if I'm Helicoprion. I'm making new teeth, but this animal connects all of those teeth onto one root, okay? And unlike every other shark you know of, these animals don't shed their teeth. They're stuck keeping their teeth forever. So if I make a new tooth all the time, making another tooth, but I have to keep them, I can't shed them, I have a space problem. The way this animal deals with the space problem, instead of growing its mouth long forward, it grows the teeth on a curve. And so the curve is made so that it can grow over top of itself over time, so that by the end of its life, it's made 100 or so teeth, and all of them are connected to one root that is locked into its mouth. So when we find the fossil, the 120 some teeth represent the entire lifespan of that whole animal. The key thing to understand is that teeth are not tiny and then get big. They're being produced at the back of the mouth and the bigger the shark, the larger the tooth that's being formed, but it never sheds them. And as I like to joke, this is the only animal in the entire history of life that I know of that has cheated the tooth fairy. It doesn't shed them, it keeps them. But you know, it's using that, these teeth in this weird middle line between the jaws. What are some, some of the other related forms? Wait, don't some rodents, their teeth, don't, don't they curl down and below and actually, if they're not cut, <laughs> will go back into the jaw? That's true. They have to wear them down or else they keep growing and growing but, and growing and growing. But they grow in spirals. Ah. But they're not made to live that way for very long. Okay. Our guy can live for that. Uh, so if we look at the uh, animals that are related to Helicoprion, there are other animals that have midline teeth that follow a curve. And there's one animal in particular that's really interesting. It occurs uh, millions of years before Helicoprion. It tends to be a smaller fossil. It's an animal that is known as Toxoprion. And Toxoprion, uh, we have maybe three fossils of it so far that we know of. They're about uh, maybe an inch, two inches long total. And it's a curve, it's a spiral of teeth where the teeth are all on one root. It doesn't shed its teeth, so it keeps them all. But it doesn't commit to making a full spiral. It makes an open spiral so that the teeth don't coil on top of themselves over time. And that's the one, if I had to pick, you know, something that's on the lineage leading to Helicoprion, that's probably a good bet. Does it die before it creates a spiral? Or you just don't have specimens that show? Maybe, maybe the answer is both to that. <laughs> we don't know yet. Give me the time frame of the Helicoprion from what year, when did it die out? Yeah, so Helicoprion is an animal that is... Uh, in the, the very latest early Permian or the middle Permian in a non-technical sense. Age of fishes. We have... No, 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 Dave. It's not in the Devonian, Dave, which is the age of fishes. The Permian, at the end of the Permian, there's the biggest dying off of the planet, the hugest extinction. Extinction, right. But this shark flourished around the world, right, Leaf? Uh, yeah. Before the Permian extinction, it had a 10 million year run. About, yeah, eight, like to ten, eight to 10 million years that it's around. And the, the thing about Helicoprion, it's the largest animal on the planet up until right. that time. It is the biggest of the big, uh, is the most successful apex predator uh, ever to live on the planet anywhere, period, up to that point. White Dunkleosteus has got to be bigger. No. No? 35, 40 feet? No. You're getting up to 35, 40 feet now? Yep. With our shark? Yep. Wow, that is massive. What's the biggest world in your collection? Where, the, biggest where are you? the biggest complete world we have is 56 centimeters. I remember that number off top. So that's about two and a half feet. And then you have to have the cranium beyond that. That's just the size of its lower jaw. So you have to have a cranium behind that and then the rest of the body. Of course, we don't have the fossil of the rest of the body. So I can, I can maybe right. make the guess. Hey, that's but, what we're doing. Yeah, but here's ahead. the thing. That's of complete world. Now we've, we have so many fossils. We have almost 90 Helicoprions in our collection. The largest one we have is an incomplete specimen. The teeth on that one are huge. They are bigger than the biggest world we have, complete world. And so it's a partial. And doing the math, if we you know, graph this out, we can sort of estimate how big that thing was. 
it's bigger than two and a half feet, it's pushing three. That's where, that's where we, ex we might be able to get into a 35, 40 foot shark. I have many uh, uh, sketchbook entries. I've, I've chased down tales of the giant whirls and yeah. I've been to the mines and talked to people and I keep hearing legends of the five foot whirl <laughs> that's out there. So. I, well, uh, just before this call, I was, t I was uh, looking through an old book that my predecessor here at the museum had and he had a crib note that said he had heard of six foot whirls from some miners in Soda Springs. Oh, and man. the tall tale just gets taller. Yeah, well, well, where, where are they? And <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. My question is, are there actual beautiful enameled teeth like you find in a megalodon? Yes, yes. The, the tooth enamel and the root, um, we have examples where it's not just an impression. A lot of them are impressions, but we have a lot of like full teeth. Everything's preserved. All the original chemistry is there. It's really good. Wow. I have a question for you, Leif. Uh, you know, yeah. when I was look, when we were reading your resume, uh, yes, sir. you like to be a field geologist and paleontologist. Are you going out actively hunting? Do you ever go to the mines or what's going on in the mines themselves? They give us a call up every once in a while and invite us into their, of course, it's an active mine. So I mentioned earlier in the program that, that uh, phosphate is one of these sedimentary rocks that's pretty rare but it's economically super important. Uh, it's where we get fertilizers from and it's uh, explosives and fire, you know, like the match head, the red part on the match head is made of phosphorus. So we've been here in East Idaho, been mining this deposit of phosphorus that we have here for over a hundred years. And so we've got mines around Pocatello and Soda Springs just to the east of us. And there are active, several active mines right now that are digging up this really dark brown colored rock. It's really kind of exotic looking stuff. And it's got 25% uh, phosphorus in it. Anyway, it's in those very rocks. That's an ocean floor sediment that was forming back in the Permian. It's those very same rocks that are recording our helicoprion animal. And so they get lots and lots and lots of helicoprions that come out. And occasionally when they're digging this stuff up with their giant excavators, uh, one of the workers will see one of these things in the wall, will call us up and go out there. So uh, we seem to be getting one or two new ones every year right now. We go out to visit the mines on occasion uh, and chat with the workers over there. And they're all super interested in what we're doing. What other fossils are you finding in there besides the oh helicoprion? So uh, it turns out the Phosphoria formation that's really rich in helicoprion has a lot of fossils in it. Uh, some of the, the next biggest fossils that we find are uh, the squid relatives, the ammonoids and, uh, and nautiloids. So these are coiled shells that are, some of them two feet in diameter, just the same size as the helicoprion spirals. Um, some are smaller. And these are, we think, are, are some of the prey items that these sharks were eating. I was just um, going to say, what yeah. did the helicoprion Oh, eat? yeah. No doubt. Uh, so we're finding really big bodied squid type animals. So I think helicoprion, one of the main food groups that they were eating was calamari. Uh, their, their teeth are designed to cut through sliced meat. Uh, so they're definite, you know, predators eating meat. But here's the weird thing. Uh, out of all the thousands of teeth that we've looked at, there are only like 200 helicoprion specimens in the world. That's it. So it's fairly rare in the world. That is rare, yes. We have 125 of those have come from Idaho. So that tells you how, uh, how important the mines are, really, at being able to recover these. They're, I think that's one of the reasons we have so much. Not only were they here, and the rocks are the right type to preserve them very well, but we're digging into these rocks for 100 years. Uh, we're not just relying on erosion to bring them to the surface. Anyway, with all of those fossils, all of the ones that we've seen, worn down teeth and chip teeth are extremely rare. And so that led the first researcher uh, to really tackle helicoprion, this Russian by the name of Karpinsky. He originally drew the spiral of teeth on the back and on the tail because That's he couldn't, tough. or even coming out the nose because he could not imagine that this animal was biting anything with it because he never found wear pattern or, bite or broken teeth. So he said, no, 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 they're not biting with it. It's gotta be outside the body. We brought in a modern day uh, biologist to uh, calculate the bite force of did. this, did we not? We did, we Part brought in a couple. So yeah, so Cheryl Wilga and, uh, and Jason Ramsey did some numbers on that. And uh, oh, it was, it was thousands of Pascals 
or sorry, newtons or whatever they're measuring, right? And uh, isn't it pounds per square inch? Isn't that how they do the uh, great white and uh, yeah. the lions? That's right. So there, the summary uh, that they found was that this is a, a bite force that's stronger than any modern fish, uh, any modern mammal. Uh, and it's comparable to some of the ancient sharks, like uh, megalodon bite forces that are recorded in, in the literature, that kind of thing. So it had one hell of a bite. Like this thing would really bite down hard. Do you have any empirical evidence as to the prey animal? Ah, oh, I wish. So what we'd really need is uh, a coprolite would be great, right? Uh, it'd be wonderful to find like an animal with a big bite mark in it. That would be cool. Well, why aren't there coprolites if they're in a big phosphorus? Yeah, we talked about poo. Guarantee. I absolutely guarantee there are coprolites out there. Um, one of the reasons we don't have them, I think, has to do with, you know, in a mining setting, you can find big things. They're finding the big things. I think they're there. But if you're using a big, you know, uh, excavator or something like that to scrape these off, you're, you're going to miss a lot of the small stuff. Do you think with the, with the new excavation that's going on, some of this uh, new material they're running through in the mine, mm -hmm. that there might be the possibility of an, a body impression? I'm hoping one day they're going, the way they uh, excavate this often is they'll bring a bulldozer right over the surface of the, of the ore and they'll scrape off a big chunk. So they're we'll scraping the off a big chunk, and it's very possible that we might get a spiral. And if you look carefully, you'll see a tail on the other end. Has you know? there ever been a cartilaginous body impression of any animal in the fossil record? I don't think so. Well, sure. we do have uh, we do have the outlines and the body and the scales, uh, either as impressions or the scales themselves preserved of many sharks. You, if you have the right conditions, you can get that uh, preserved. Adestus, oh, right? Adestus. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have partial impressions of Adestus, not a full body yet, unfortunately, but there's a lot of other uh, sharks that we get, especially in shale deposits, where you get the outline of the body preserved very nicely. Which reminds us, we, we were discussing the different types of tooth arrangements of this, what's it called? Phasial uh, Oh, symphysial. What? Symphysial. Symphysial dentition? Got it, yeah. Exactly. So what other amazing creatures were there? So there's this really, really cool animal. That's the common name we've given it is the scissor tooth shark. And I gave it that, man. Ray gave that. It's a good name. It's a good name. So we've got an animal that lived in Chicago. Chicago? Back uh, in the Pennsylvanian time period, which is a little earlier, right? So we're in the 300 million year old time range, a little older than Helicoprion. And it was living in what, what is now Chicago, used to be a very, very shallow seaway that cut into the Midwest. And occasionally the sea would dry out and you'd get coal swamps and coal deposits. So this is why we get coals in Illinois, Kentucky, India, Southern Indiana, and so forth. In those coal mines today, this is a really cool story, in the coal mines today where they excavate out the coal, they finish getting all the coal out they move on to the next mine. In those mine tunnels, the, uh, the rock eventually dries out and the roof collapses. And so this animal, Edestis, that we're gonna talk about, the scissor tooth shark, is always found in the rocks of the roof, of the ceiling of coal mines that collapse and fall to the ground. Okay, so that means it's in a strata of, yes. that's, that's, that's later than the coal deposits. It comes in. And, and geologically, what happens is those, the, um, the environments change over time as sea level goes up and down. And the Pennsylvanian is famous for having repeated sea level going up and down and up and down and up and down as glaciers are melting and freezing and melting and freezing. And so we have these repeated intervals of coal over, laying over by shales. And the shale represents a flooding over as sea level rises and floods out that marshy coal area. And it's an estuary environment. Exactly. It's kind of like a bayou. Think of a bayou in Chicago. And it's in those bayous that we have Edestus, the scissor tooth shark, swimming around. Man, I feel a song coming on. It's, there you go. <laughs> it's kind of cool. But yes, Dr. Zangerl, my mentor who taught me all about these things, he knew all about Edestus, the scissor tooth shark. And he showed me those fossils and he showed me x rays which were sort of the uh, prehistoric version of the modern day CT scans. But he had all these beautiful x-rays and you see these blades and these heads and these big smears of organic material and these black shales. But 
Hey, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, have you ever tried a UV light on any of uh, your fossils there at Idaho, just to we, see if there's organic material that would show up with that? We haven't tried UV light. I'm, I'm interested to try it out to see what comes up. There's certainly lots of organic signal on the surface, so it's hmm. entirely possible we might see something new with that. Hey, Alif, can I ask you, it's got an upper blade and a lower blade, sort of, and they're shedding their teeth. That's right. But they still have these symphysial centerline teeth. How are those blades working with each other? You guys have some, and Cheryl Wilga has worked with you guys too on this, that's, right? That's right. So, so we took Zangrel's collection. He, he produced an amazing collection of Edestus that now can be found at the Field Museum in Chicago. So I, I spent a number of weeks over in their collections finding all of his goodies. And uh, one specimen in particular has a full skull of a juvenile Edestus with both the upper and lower banana-shaped blades of teeth, along with the full skull. It's all there. So we x-rayed it, and we also CT scanned it. And what we find in that animal when we reconstruct it, it had two, it had the upper blade and a lower blade that are much, they're not quite as curved as, as we get in helicoprine that make the big full spiral. They're a little straighter than that. But these two, um, open and close on the jaws, but the lower jaw has a double joint. And so it's allowed to, as the animal bites down, the two bananas of teeth are kind of parallel to each other. And as it closes, it brings its lower jaw and pulls it back at the very end. So it's kind of like a reciprocating saw. Oh my God. Where the two opposing blades actually slice by the lower jaw moving backwards. It's crazy. It's good. So that hinge in the lower jaw is, is clearly visible in that one specimen? Yeah, so it's, it's actually, it's a double hinge in the upper jaw. So the quadrate, oh, okay. the, the quadrate has an extra, it looks like a joint with the palatine at the front of the upper jaw to make this, this double joint with the lower jaw. So it, ha so it has this extra ability to uh, bring the jaw inward. It's like bringing your teeth of your lower jaw back and sucking your chin in. Is there anything in the world that is even close to resembling oh. this arrangement? Well, certainly not with the midline teeth. The midline teeth is kind of unusual to do that. But maybe the closest thing that you could think of is, is the kinetic jaw that we have in lizards and snakes, where they have these multiple jaw points and mosasaurs, if you think of the marine reptile of the Mesozoic. The unhinging of the jaw. They, can, uh, they, they sort of have these multiple joints, instead of just being a, a simple jaw joint that opens and closes, they have multiple ones. So they can really do some really fascinating things in their bite. One of my, when I try to think about an analog for helicoprion, you know, yeah. with the big spiral in the lower jaw, this very narrow lower jaw and basically no teeth in the upper jaw, the only analog I can really kind of come up with is a sperm whale. That's right. Super narrow lower jaw with teeth in it and no teeth in the upper jaw, but it's sort of a chamber. And that's, what do they eat? Big squid. Exactly so, you know, I keep thinking that's- Oh, that's amazing. And yeah. in yeah. the upper jaw, the sperm whale, there's holes where the bottom teeth fit in, correct? Huh? Ooh. I don't know. We'll have to have, uh, we'll have to talk I, to a sperm whale person. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I happen to know one that we could talk to, but- um... Ray, ask Leaf that helicoprion question that you've been dying to ask him. Oh, okay. Is it a shark leaf? Well, it depends what you mean by the definition of a shark ray. <laughs> there we go. Shark ray? <laughs> shark ray. So there are two major groups of sharks. There are sort of the modern sharks that we think of first, right? The uh, great whites, the hammerheads, and all of them. Uh, and that's, you know, the funny thing is that diversity of sharks is really happening after Helicoprion comes along. If you were back in the time of Helicoprion, it's the other branch of the family tree that you would think of as being a shark. The chimeras. These, they are the chimeras and the ratfish of today. <laughs> right? And so back then, before ratfish and chimera, it was really the helicoprions and the edestuses, and they were the diversity. That's where all the experimentation and interesting stuff was happening in shark world. Wait a minute. Is, could helicoprion be a ratfish, a, a, a chimera? They are on the same family lineage as modern day chimera and ratfish. And so it's, it's not quite correct to say that helicoprion give rise to, right? But they're on that same family tree. Absolutely. They are the badass members of the chimera club, you know, the ancient, uh, when, when, when chimeras were super bad. That's right. They, they think of their inner helicoprion. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Leaf. Yeah. I got a question for you. Okay. 
There you are. You lived, uh, you know, you're, you're a younger guy, but still you've, you've had many fossil adventures. What is the coolest fossil that you have ever found or beheld in your life? fossil that I've ever found or oh boy on the spot uh lots of them um for various different reasons <laughs> a clam. you might imagine well no. gosh yeah um a clam burrowing and sh that was that was a good day that was, was a really good day did I'm you freak you. out was like that was the best it'll ever be come on what's what's the best one what do you, you know got, I I'm gonna nerd out on you a little bit I I was out in the uh in the Kaperowitz formation and the Wawweep formation actually we we're in the Wawweep this is down in southern Utah this must be a good almost 20 years ago and uh we were hiking around people hadn't really looked in the Wawweep for dinosaurs yet and I came across a, a ceratopsian horn that was just sitting there on the ground and I found it and knew immediately, like, oh, this is dinosaur. This is something cool. It's a triceratops or something. It was, uh, yeah, it's one of the new, it might have been Nasutoceratops, actually. Um, found one of the first specimens of that one, just hanging out on the ground. Wow. And, you know, so I, I don't work on dinosaurs, but I work in places that have dinosaurs. I work with a lot of dinosaur paleontologists. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's really hard to focus on your clams when you've got dinosaur bones <laughs> shutting out of the ground all the time. You have to reorient yourself and say, you're here for the clam. You're here for the clam, not the dinosaur. But it's still pretty awesome to find a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Did you excavate the rest of that animal? Well, you saw that. Well, uh, I saw it, and then the it? so I turned it over to the rest of the crew that was with me, and they wound up digging it up. Yeah, there was a there was a full skull in the ground with that one. Wow, they're big. Yeah, they're huge. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's when you uh, you you walk away and let other people dig it up and deal with the gnats. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> and they throw it on a uh, flatbed truck. No, they helicopter those things out. Oh wow! They have to get the big chopper in. Wow, <laughs> it's a big operation. And uh, it's really beautiful to know that you're speaking from Pocatello, the buzzsaw capital of the world. Oh my goodness! You have those beliefs, man. People are coming for the sharks now, aren't they? They do come for the sharks. Come for the sharks, stay for the potatoes. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got to see your museum. I'm coming. Hey, Leaf, it's been really good connecting here with you today. And uh, I like the COVID look. It's looking good there. You got the beard going. We're getting pretty scruffy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I see some Adestus blades on your uh Yeah, your, I see that behind you. Adestus blades. Yeah. Wait, there's the Buzzsaw Shark poster it's up back there. there, too. There's a shark. And, uh, and oh. uh, the axe thing is up there. Oh, actually, my cutter. Oh, oh there that, it is. There it is. The cutter. You ever get it out and chop with it, man? <laughs> That thing is so dangerous. It is, that, dangerous. It is amazingly dangerous. By the dangerous. way, I don't think we explained this properly. You built a kind of replica of the helicoprion on almost like a machete, almost like a meat cutter, like a paper cutter type thing, right? You cut chunks of meat with it, didn't you? Uh, cut everything with it. Our good friend Gary Staub uh, did a bronze cast of a tooth whirl, and I just wanted to see how that sucker would cut. Real basic, uh, you know, art kind of experiment, but. Uh, There's a video somewhere. Where's that video, Ray? What, we got the video online, the, the, the tease of the buzzsaw shark. If you Google that, you'll find it. You've cut fish with it, right? We cut fish with it. People brought uh, cantaloupes, watermelons, Coca-Cola cans, all that kind toothpaste. of Toothpaste. I remember toothpaste is really yeah. sticky. Yeah. Um, this is not the end, but. We've seen recently that science and facts have kind of taken a back seat to propaganda and people's opinion. Uh, you're in an academic situation. How can we convince people that facts are real, facts are facts, and to double check your sources? How do we propagate the idea that science is something that's verifiable and needs to be followed? Yeah, you know, it's it's maybe the crisis of our day, right? Um, we this it's so funny that we have we've never had so much information at our fingertips. That that's a double-edged sword, right? And and knowing who to listen to, I think honestly, I think most people want to get it right. I think people want uh, to know what the truth is with a capital T as best as possible. Um, 
but it's hard when there's a lot of, of, of noise out there. And how do you kind of weave your way through and get to what matters? You know, I think the, the best way uh, personally is to practice it in how I talk to people. I, I talk like a, a nerdy scientist a lot of the time in the way that scientists write papers, which is to be careful in your wording. I don't believe that um, a vaccine works. I read papers that tell me that it's demonstrated many, many different ways that it works, right? I don't believe that it works. I rely on evidence to inform my decision. So remove words like belief. I think you have to be careful that the term belief works in certain cases, right? It's perfectly fine to believe in God or to uh, have a, I believe that Britney Spears is awesome. <sighs> <laughs> but uh, I don't believe that helicoprion looked this way or that. No, I have anatomical evidence, and to the best of my ability, I've reconstructed it, and it suggests that the animal looked and behaved this way. So the language that I use is the way that I communicate to others, whether I know something or admit freely that I don't know something, but I choose to believe it. That's great. That's encouraging to hear. That's well put, Leif. Thanks a lot, Leif. That was awesome. Appreciate it. You betcha. <laughs> you were great. Right. Really perfect. Take care, okay. guys. Later. Bye. Okay. Bye. Wasn't he cool? The Canadian clam man bitten by a shark. And uh, Leif, is, uh, he's a great communicator and he tells a good story. I'm just blown away on how big this, this shark must have been. Well, we heard about two foot whirls and three foot whirls. And we learned, I learned something new today that uh, up until that point in time, it was probably the biggest creature to have ever evolved on the planet. Helicoprion was the at that time. beast no, at, at that the time. time. Up until right. that time, even before Duthliostis didn't And get what time name, are we man. talking about? The end of the Permian? Toward no. the end of the Permian, not the very end of the Permian. We're about 270 million years ago. And here we are sitting, a couple of vertebrates. Yeah. Now, we would not be related to a shark, no. No. What would we be? What would our ancestors be swimming with? At some point, we're related to everything. Of we course. But so we are related to sharks, but we're not direct descendants. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Is this a ventriloquist and an artist trying to remember this scientific is a ventriloquist. stuff that we have yeah, no trying to be all idea? Science yeah, we have, we have no kind of semi-clueless. But we're fun. Yeah, we're it's fun. It's fun. And I'm going to raise my hand and say, I have no clue. I have a couple of clues. I have more clues than you do. Yes, you do. And I bow to your paleo intelligence. Thank you. I like it when you do that, Dave. I'm going to sign off from Ojai, California. Ojai, from California. Beautiful Catch Can, Alaska. It's Ray Stroll saying, see you later. All right. Don't be a paleo nerd. Be a paleo nerd. Thank you for listening to Paleo Nerds. Make sure to like and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. If you want to learn more about what you heard today, check out our website, paleonerds.com. You'll find tons of pictures and links, including photographic evidence that today's guests and your hosts have been paleo nerds for a long, long time. Again, that's paleonerds.com. Thanks for listening. I'm a paleo nerd.